Well, good morning, family. <clears throat> it is December the 6th right now, and, and the season is upon us, isn't it? Wearing my Christmas red and looking forward to, you know, a, a season of time where we get together with family and, and friends and, um, and we get to celebrate just a little bit you know, kind of remember, uh, in our families anyway, um, who Jesus is and what he's done for us and how he came to earth and when he didn't have to, he was pretty happy in heaven and came and suffered on our behalf to redeem and bring reconciliation uh, and bring light to the world. Um, it's a... Uh, it, it's worth celebrating. <clears throat> and we believe in the virgin birth. As Christians, we believe that Jesus is fully God and, and fully man. And, um, and that is part of that theology that we hold on to so dearly in, in the midst of uh, lots of confusion in the world. But the Lord came to bring hope. Hope to the lost and to the dying and hope to those are, that are confused and, and messed up. And we're living in a, in a nation and in a world that's, that's confused and kind of messed up. And that has leaked into our own, you know, uh, Christian community worldwide. And there are lots of questions and, and difficulties out there. And, and the, we hold on to the scriptures. We hold on to the word of God. <clears throat> had a good talk the other day with a young man about just the understanding that we, we have the root and foundation of the word. And we also have the experience of the spirit of God dwelling in our lives that give witness to Christ and also gives witness to his word. And so... You know, we have um, we have a reasonable faith that speaks um, to that, that speaks to understanding and study and you know the the word of God being a foundation and that's not in <clears throat> that's not an adversary of our experience. Those two things work hand in hand together. And, um, and so we hold on to the word and there are those times where there's that experience in our lives, but it always backs the word because the Holy Spirit wrote the word. And so, <clears throat> so anyway, we're going to, we're going to pay attention to the word here and continue to go down that path. I don't know where else to go when, when, when the world is in chaos and difficulties are happening, um, that we turn to the, to the roots and the foundations of our faith. And <clears throat> it gives hope. It gives uh, perspective. It moves us toward a, an eternal perspective that, that the Lord uh, has in mind. And so, um, just a couple of things about dates. Uh, this Friday night, um, and I believe that the date on our, this, this Friday is the 8th. And, and so, um, we're heading up to St. Charles, just as a, kind of a little community and gathering together and just kind of get into the season a little bit and do something social together. We're going to meet about 6.30. There's a, pav a pavilion up there in, in St. Charles. and um, But they kind of had just a, you know, down the cobblestone street of Main Street there. They, you know, they have characters and carolers and it's kind of the season. And there are little shops that have, you know, that have popcorn and hot chocolate and cookies and lots of different little things. And so 
we're going to meet up there about 6.30. And, um, and then probably what we'll do is, is walk around that, you know, that area in small groups. Um, it'll be very crowded. The weather's supposed to be pretty decent. And, <clears throat> and trying to keep a big group together will be really difficult. And but we're also not going to be meeting for dinner beforehand. Um, we're just going to meet about 6.30 there. <clears throat> Give people time to, you know, finish up their work and make their way up there and find a parking place. And, and there are some parking areas that if you're unfamiliar with, with that St. Charles walk area, um, uh, Caleb and Mindy, uh, know some of those, you can contact Caleb and Mindy about, you know, the the parking areas. Um, I have a place that usually I park to, and so um, down at the far, what would be, I think it's, <laughs> I'm trying to get my directions, but the farthest end of the uh, Main Street area there, there's a parking um, public parking area that's, I think it's to the far, maybe north, um, north area, I guess. <laughs> Sorry. <clears throat> but anyway, that, that's kind of the plan. And, uh, you know, how we break down into small groups to pray for one another on Sunday mornings. That's kind of what we're going to do. We'll meet up at the pavilion, um, maybe we can get some snacks and talk a little bit together and fellowship a little bit. And then when we walk that kind of street, you just kind of grab another couple or another few folks that are around you and, and we'll just walk and, and, um, you know, spend some time together, just getting into the season. And I love the season. I love Christmas. It's a, it's a great, great time. And at least for me, it, it's a time of uh, of reflection and, and thankfulness for what the Lord has done. And it's a little easier than um, what I consider those high moments in, on the Christian calendar of, you know, Easter and, um, or I should say, Resurrection Day um, and, and Christmas, um, the birth and the death. Um, it's easier for the world to celebrate a birth of a baby than it is for the death and resurrection of a Messiah. But both of those times are, are times to reflect and be grateful and love others that are around us well. And so I'm praying for those times where we have um, divine appointments that, that the Lord sets up. So... Today, I'm going to finish up the little study that we've been going on at, um, in 1 John, and I'll finish up the last half of chapter 5, and that will, that will take us on to our next study, but this Sunday, we will discuss the end of, of John and kind of summarize that first, you know, epistle and talk a little bit about, uh, you know, what we've learned and what we've thought about. And, um, and then the following week on the 17th, we have a joint meeting at, uh, at Crestwood with, um, with our larger family coming together to sing Christmas carols. And Angela is going to be up leading on the, on the piano with members of her family and members of, <coughs> of our community. And, uh, I look forward to that. That'll be just a great time together to uh, to celebrate and and be and be part of that little bit of a larger family, larger community, and and hug and talk to other folks. It'll be good. And then the following week after that is Christmas Eve, and probably uh, we're going to leave it up to the to the two groups. And you know, if you want to meet Christmas Eve morning, certainly can do that. Uh, and we're going to be discussing it in, in our group to find out if that's a, uh, something we'll do, but I know that it's a very busy time period and family is in town and, and most likely we will, 
uh, not meet as a community that that Sunday. But um, but I'm going to leave that up to uh, you know the groups and they can decide. Um, and then the following week after that is that uh, I believe it's New Year's Eve morning, which I think we should meet and gather together and really be in that place where we're seeking the Lord for the year to come. And we will start a study of the Gospel of John. And that proclamation of that first chapter is a profound thing to start a year off with, where we <clears throat> we make that proclamation that the Word became flesh, and um, and that uh, you know our our God, who had redemption from the beginning of time in His heart and part of His plan. Um, came to earth on our behalf and and he is who he says he is so we'll be doing be doing that and um, I also want to let you know I'll be sending out my first installment of the Israel teaching um, it's like my fourth take on it I just it gets too long so I'm going to start off with three teachings. Um, hopefully they'll be shorter. <laughs> um, but I'm gonna I, I I broke down kind of the um, the history of the, of the people and the land. It's and and there is promise attached to both of those, and it's really hard to separate the two. Uh, because God has linked the the people in the land so so closely, <clears throat> and it's a fascinating study, and I hope that it will give you some um, some understanding to uh, some of the conflict that's going on over in uh, over in you know the Middle East right now, um, and that conflict has been going on for a long, long time. Um, and it's nuanced. It's not as black and white as we'd like it to be. But I start out with the the first teaching is going to be just over the biblical perspective of the people in the land, and I'll be giving times, dates, and you know a number of just factual things that I can um, that coincide with the with the Bible and the, the account in Genesis, and and then bring us up to the time of the New Testament and talk a little bit about you know Romans chapter 11 and some of the other scriptures that are attached and the history of what transpired up until that point um and that will bring us up to around um around 70 um 70 AD um even though the word like John was written around 90 uh, AD or somewhere about though I'm just giving approximations um so, <clears throat> um, and then the next teaching will be from that point around 70 AD up till around 1850, a date that I just picked out because it's kind of, um, it, it's kind of the start of what we would consider Zionism taking place um, and the call back to the land of Israel from the dispersed people of the Jews in Europe, uh, North Africa, um, and in the Middle East. And, and then, so we'll go from 70 AD approximately <clears throat> to 1850. Um, and then I'm, I'll consider from 1850 till the present day as the third teaching, and that's kind of the modern times of how Israel came into being, uh, the, the nation of Israel right now, and that land is now inhabited again by the Jews, and how that happened, and what went on, and there's some miraculous stories, and there's some some things that are not as clear, and um, I will kind of throw that out to you guys, and you guys can make some um, some.
some informed um, kind of decisions on what does it mean to really um, stand by Israel um, and yet not condone everything that that um, that a political entity does um, and and so we you know we're we'll go down that path and so I'll get that first installment probably later on today and send it out to you guys. And if you don't want to listen, don't listen. But I hope it will be helpful. Um, but let's just dive into the word real quick here. I want to read the last number of verses starting in 13 of uh, 1 John chapter 5. And it goes to 21. And it's not all that long, but it's like John just packs in a whole bunch of stuff right at the end of the letter. It kind of reminds me of you know, Paul, he's trying to finish up what he's saying, and he just, he just cramming things in. Um, and but there's some profound things here for us to, uh, to apprehend and, and understand. And as we finish this, this little study, it, um, it it's, it's a marvelous uh, way to complete our little study uh, before we engage in the season that we're in and then start into the gospel. So, <clears throat> so let's read, starting in verse 13. And again, I have to remind you guys that you take this within the context of the whole book. Um, we, we're not just cherry-picking a few verses and then, you know, uh, forgetting what we've already, <laughs> already discussed. It doesn't make sense unless you have that kind of context. And... Um, and we also understand that there's context, context through the whole scripture of, you know, of all the New Testament, the, the, the message of the gospel. And then there is uh, the context starting in Genesis all the way through Revelation. And all these things work together in a beautiful picture that is, um, that is really profound. Um, and I always just continue to remind you guys that the primary focus and purpose of the scripture is to reveal God, to reveal his purpose, his plan, his personality, his character, his nature, who he is, because it's in him and knowing him that we find our place. Uh, in the fullness of time, in eternity. And so, um, so anyway, we'll start with that. So John, aged apostle here, he's writing to the church and he, and he writes, These things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, in order that you may know that you have eternal life security and understanding of turning to the Lord and and that word believe isn't isn't a mental assent to a, a set of facts it's a submission to uh, to a Messiah it is it is the turning from one way of life to another that our belief system actually changes our everyday actions and how we live. Um, <clears throat> it, it's, it's an amazing thing. And it isn't just me working up my faith. Oh, I just believe, I believe, I believe. No, it, it is the understanding of this story of redemptive plan of God on the earth and that he sent his son in order to cover our sin and every one of us is a fallen sinful selfish self-centered people and that he's calling us to live differently than that that's what believe is believe isn't just kind of you know i i i believe that Joe Biden is the president of the United States, a fact that is irrefutable right now. Um, 
It's just there. But does it change your actions? Does it change who you are? The understanding of belief in Christ does. It changes. It actually transforms us into his image. And that's what he's talking about in, in, in belief. And, and so um, let's read on. And this is the confidence which we have before him that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. Um, notice it doesn't say according to our will or our desire or what we want. It's asking in accordance with his will, which means we have to know what his will is and understand further what his will is. So, and if we know that he hears us in whatever we ask, we know that we have the requests which we have asked from him. Again, it's tied to his will, his desire, his purpose, his plan. It's not just about our selfish greed and desire. And sometimes I just want to tell you that, that, that in James, it says that, you know, we don't have because we don't ask. And he's a good father. He loves us and he loves to give us good gifts. Uh, and we can ask for things, but it, it's, um, but our confidence in a good father is really important. And the confidence in that we know that his will is best, that we trust his will over our will, over our desire. And so there are times that we ask for things that we want, and the Lord doesn't grant them because he knows better than we do. Um, but when we're praying in accordance with his will, we can know that he hears and that he answers. Um, then we go on to a, a little bit of a different topic here. If anyone sees his brother committing a sin, not leading to death, he shall ask, and God will for him give life to those who commit sin, not leading to death. There is a sin leading to death. I do not say that he should make request for this. All unrighteousness is sin, and there is a sin not leading to death. This is part of our community life, is that the standards and, and the life that, that Christ gives to us, he knows how this machine human being works. He created us. He knows what's best. <clears throat> and um, and he's trustworthy. And um, and when we know one another, you, you know, I love the fact that we have home church. Uh, people walk into my house, walk into the Sipes house, walk have you know walked into the Starry's house and into Donald Norton's house and into you know, in, into the Breckenridge's house and into, um, you know, the, the Steen's home and walked into um, the Leaker's home. You know, I mean, our, our little community, we, we kind of move around a little bit, but we're in homes. But we know one another, at least to some more intimate degree. Uh, we know how people live and how, where they live and what their you know, some of their values are and and sometimes when they're doing good and sometimes when they're when we're not doing so good and and it's all part of life together and I I so appreciate that. It's 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 a beautiful thing. And in knowing one another, we can actually love one another enough to say, man, are you doing okay? You seem like you're you're struggling. You seem like you're you know you're dealing with some issues that might not be might not be leading to the right place. And so we're able to help one another. And, and, and so, um, and, and so we're able to walk out, you know, a, a righteousness that is based upon 
scriptural understanding upon revelation by the Holy Spirit and in community with one another, and, and it's, it, it, it gives life, it gives hope, and we stand with one another in good times and bad, and times of health and times of, of not good health, and times where we're struggling because of circumstances that are around us that are bringing us down, and times when things are going really good, you know, um, whether it's times of plenty or times of, of poverty, it's, um, we live together and, and we're able to encourage one another while it is day. Now, I just read those scriptures and all of you guys are going, but what's the sin that leads to death that we're not supposed to be praying for? You know, and, and I hop back to that, um, you, you know, the blaspheming of the Holy Spirit and um and and so here we go <laughs> i'll give you my thoughts anyway um that sin that he's talking about is attached to the idea that we just talked about in belief um what do we believe? It isn't a one-time sin activity that the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit is, or Hebrews chapter six, where it talks about you know those those that have known and tasted of of the things of heaven. Um, if they turn, they're never again brought to repentance. These these are heavy difficult things. And I believe that he talks about this just a little bit as we go on here. Um, and um, so I'm going to read just a, a couple more verses and then I'll address that. We know that no one who is born of God sins. Again, the, the, he's speaking of something and it's plural. It's ongoing take that in mind but he who is born of god keeps him and the evil one does not touch him that can be difficult um because we live in a fallen world and the evil one you know the idea of touching us um but again within the context you know where jesus says um don't be afraid of those that can destroy the body. But have your fear attached to the Lord who talks about the eternal soul. And, and again, we, we, you have to take all this stuff within the context of all of Scripture, not just um, what we might think out of that one cherry-picking verse. So... We know that we are of God and the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. Um, I believe that what he's getting at here is what the scripture has got, has been getting to all along. Um, What's the practice of our life? What's the root and foundation of our faith? It's the idea of believing, but that believing isn't just that mental ascent again, that if we are in the place where our lifestyle is not, um, does not align with what the Lord is doing, it will bring about death. Um, I believe what he's talking about is the denial of the faith, not an individual sin. I don't believe that it's that the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit is, um, is all of a sudden we're confronted with a really difficult situation and we deny the faith even in the 
face of that for, you know, for a moment of time, and then there's repentance and regret afterwards, that's not what he's talking about. Matter of fact, I tell people, um, if you're worried about the unforgivable sin, then you haven't committed it. Because the idea is, like Paul talks about, is having your conscience seared. And that the faith is no longer the faith. And that I don't believe that Jesus is who he said he is. I don't believe in Christian basic doctrine that we all hold to. I don't believe it, it's, a, it's a turning. And it takes a long time for that to happen where your conscience is seared. Matter of fact, when you get to that point, most people that do get to that point, that have gone down that path, that deny the faith, um, are virulent about it. They are sometimes rooted in bitterness or anger or hurt or pain or whatever it is, and they are vehemently denying the truth of the scripture, the truth of the gospel, the, 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 the character and nature of God, the idea that Christ came in the flesh. Some of the things we've been talking about all along, I believe that is what grieves the Holy Spirit. I believe that is what, when you go down that path, that you can get so far that, there's, that you won't repent like it says in Hebrews 6. Um, now, there's a whole branch of the church that believes that, um, that if you got to that point, then you never were saved. And I, I don't know how to parse that out. Um, I don't know. I, I think in Hebrews chapter 6, it says those that have tasted of the eternal, that have seen and have proclaimed and lived in a way that was that was an indicator, and then turn and deny everything about their their experience and the Word of God. Um, they don't want to repent. They don't want to turn back. They have given themselves over to whatever the flesh or whatever the desire is for the moment. But I think that even if they do run down that path and they do repent after denying the faith, God still has room and they're saved. But I think he knows human nature well enough that he's not saying that he wouldn't forgive and wouldn't accept and wouldn't draw them back and always wants them to be part of who he is and always wants to bring redemption. That's his heart. That's what he does. That's his character. But I think he recognizes that man um, will at times go to that point. And it's the denial of the faith. It's not, I'm stumbling and dealing with some areas in my life that I'm having a hard time overcoming, whether it's, you know, whether it's greed or lust or you know, people have habits of life that are that are really difficult or or even drug addiction or, you know, alcoholism or whatever those things are that are that are sinful and evil. But the idea is that they're fighting against it. Um, and they're repenting and then getting back up and and then falling again and then repenting. And, you know, but it's there, there's a fight going on. There's a there's a struggle. And that, and that God is drawing them and he's giving grace upon grace. And um, the idea in these scriptures where it talks about sins or practicing sin, um, giving yourself over to it and just saying, you know what? I don't believe that it makes any difference anymore. I don't believe in the scripture. I don't believe that I, that's my take on that unpardonable, unforgivable or whatever it is, sin. It isn't. Even, I, I think that's man's terms that are used for the unpardonable or unforgivable. I think God forgives every sin, even 
apostasy, even turning away. He is desiring to give grace to anyone that turns. But I think he knows that we can get to a point where we're hardened so much that we won't turn. And then it becomes an issue where um, human will is, is superseding God's grace. And I know that's very controversial in the whole Calvinist world, but I'm just telling you that I believe that, that, um, that our God always wants to give mercy, always wants to forgive, and that it's mankind choosing to reject, not God choosing to reject. So there you go. There's my little discourse on the unpardonable sin. <laughs> Or the sin that we shouldn't pray for or whatever that, you know, however you want to, you know, put those in, into words. So, and then it's interesting to say, you know, that, that the evil one doesn't touch us, but, but he's talking about touching who we really are, that inner human soul that's eternal. And that obviously the evil one can touch our bodies. There's martyrdoms that happen all the time. You know, people give up their lives and, you know, um, it's not what he's talking about. He's, he's talking about, ooh, that thing within the very soul of mankind. God holds that precious and wants to keep that preserved, even though the evil one can touch us in other ways. And then in 19, you know, he goes on to say, we know we're of God, but the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. Um, I just want to tell you how, however you look at the kingdom of God, um, the kingdom of God is not fully manifest right now because the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. Political systems systems of the world are in the hands of a ruling power. Like Paul talks about, our fight is not against flesh and blood, but against powers and principalities that rule in these areas. And, and that the final showdown at the end of the age is not going to be just us on the earth and mankind doing evil to one another. It is a showdown between the forces of righteousness in the heavenlies and the forces of righteousness and evil on the earth. And God is going to come as Messiah and he's going to rule in Jerusalem and he's going to set up his kingdom. And, and in doing so, he's going to make a statement for all of eternity and say everything that mankind has produced in and of himself all humanism and God and, and man exalting himself will be shown to be foolishness and shown to be inadequate. And that ruling and reigning for that millennial time period is a proof to the rest of the world that everything that mankind has done, the best that he can come up with is inadequate and that we need Jesus. Paul talks about this present evil age, and we live in a present evil age. I don't know about you, but I still get shocked by the fast changes that happen in culture and and the denial of, of so many of the truths. And But I shouldn't be shocked. <laughs> you know, uh, we, we should understand that, that we live... Um, behind enemy lines and that the days are evil because there's ruling powers that are evil and they want to oppose God. They want to have their own DNA attached to their own people and have them follow the, the, their way. 
and they hate what God has created in his image. The idea of being an image bearer, just because we're human, just because we are born onto this earth, every human has value from the moment there's conception because it is in the image of God that we are created. And we are image bearers. Even if that image can be marred with, you know, birth defect or whatever the other things are that are going on, it doesn't mar the image of God. It may mar the physical condition that we live in, but the image of God is within every human. I just want to tell you that, that I, uh, abortion is an, is an issue, certainly in my own heart, because it, it, it is annihilating the image bearers um, like murder is. And I think the, those, are, those are really difficult issues doesn't mean that God can't have great mercy upon those that have stumbled into things that are wrong and have great mercy and care and desire to see redemptive grace given to every person, even if they've gone down a path where they've had 10 abortions. It's, it's the issue is, though, an awakening to the truth of the scripture where we're image bearers. Um, and that our fight is not against flesh and blood, but against powers and principalities that want to annihilate the image of God on the earth. <sighs> Heavy stuff. But, um, but this is where we live. We live behind enemy lines, and we gather together in community, and we encourage one another while it is day. And Caleb has been talking about the perseverance of the saints, how, you know, we, we need one another to, to persevere through times of, uh, of difficulty and confusion and, and um, opposition. And not just that, but we are called to a mission to bring that message of eternal hope. Jesus said, I came to give you eternal life. We wanted to say, I came to give you anything you want on this earth anytime you want it. That's not what he's promised. What he's promised is eternal life. And the millennials and ages to come and the years and the millions of years that are set before us and that we were born bearing the image of God and being discipled into that image because of our fallen nature and God doing that for all of eternity. This, you know, this 80, 80 years of time on the earth seems like a, seems like a little speck on the timeline, but he's come to give us eternal life. And in this present evil age, we need to encourage one another and love one another. The radical nature of Christianity can be found in the Sermon on the Mount. The radical nature, the, the radical, those that are really radical. And I think about, you know, in ages past, you've got, you know, the, 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 the radical Quakers and radical end of the faith. Um, that radical end of things is that we're called to love our enemies and lay our lives down for those that hate us. That's unlike any other religion on the face of the earth. Um, I just want to tell you that, that some of the struggle that's going on in the Middle East is a struggle between powers and principalities that are at work. And the radical nature of some of the teachings of, of Islam, that radical thing is not the same as Christianity. It isn't that you love your enemies. 
and lay your life down for those that hate you. It's not that. So, let's finish this up. And we know that the Son of God has come and has given us understanding in order that we might know him who is true. We know him. It's a personal him who has a personality. God is not, like in Star Wars, a, a force on the earth or a force in whatever <laughs> that world is. It's not some kind of impersonal um, force of nature. It's him. It's the person and personality and character of God who is, and we're made in his image. God has emotion, just like we do. God has plans and purposes that are good, that are beyond our knowledge. God is a personality, not just a force. And we get to know him. Amazing. It doesn't say that we're going to get to know everything. Because I'm not sure our minds and our hearts can handle that. But we get to know him and grow in him, in the knowledge of God for all of eternity. What a beautiful thing that's going to be, or that is, because we're, we're getting to know a little bit of the pieces of him as we walk along on this fallen world. And he is true. Again, um, there's fact and then there's truth. He is truth. That includes fact. It isn't, well, what's your truth? Because everybody has their own little truth. No, <laughs> that's not, that, that is not true. <laughs> How's that? Truth is found in him. He defines it not us. We don't get to define our own truth. If you do, then you're, then you're, you're your own God, which is what the world tells us. And that's the very deception from the very beginning. And the deception and the temptation in the Garden of Eden. You can be your own God, which is what our society tells us. And that fight is a strong one in our own lives because we want to be our own God. All right. And we are in him who is true. In his son, Jesus Christ. This is the true God and eternal life. He is truth. Then he gives this little, you know, this little instruction in this, in, in verse 21. Little children, you know, again, here is this father of the faith who's aged, getting ready to go on to see the Lord. And he's trying to impart something to the church. And he says, little children, guard yourselves from idols. Now, within the Greek culture of the day, there are many idols that were set up. But we have this idea that he's only talking about some statuary somewhere that we bow down to. Um, idols are things that we set up that are in opposition to the Lord. I believe our number one idol is ourselves. We set ourselves upon the throne of our own lives to make our own decisions and we idolize our own will, we idolize our own desire, we idolize our own emotion, and those things are all can be redeemed when they're in submission to the Lord, to his truth, and being in 
him. <laughs> um, but held out on their own, they will cause calamity and, and, and problems. And we see that all around us in, in our culture this day, where crime is going out of control, <clears throat> where um, different agendas are proclaimed as truth, and then um, there's violence. There isn't an ability to communicate on any level. There is cancel culture that's going on all around us. If I don't like what you say, then I'm never going to have any, any, you know, conversation or communication with you. We see that all through. And the root of that is that we're idolizing ourselves and unwilling to put God on that throne and point people to the direction of who he is. And in this season of time, we get to do that a little bit, to follow what John has instructed us to give people hope in eternal life, to instruct them even on the areas of fear of the Lord as compared to the fear of man. We get to talk just a little bit about the fact that our God is greatly merciful and that the sin that leads to death is what we do in denying who he is. It isn't the person that is struggling or the homeless person that is, that is struggling with drug addiction and is just a mess. It isn't somebody that struggles with some certain sin in their lives. It's the embracing of ourselves as our own God and idolizing who we are in opposition to who he is. And Jesus came to break that cycle, came to break that cycle in our own lives, to turn us from ourselves to the embracing of him, the eternal God, who is always good, always merciful, always kind, and always coming to bring a message of hope and redemption and light to those that are in darkness. I love you guys. Uh, think about maybe, you know, coming out and joining us on Friday night if you want to battle the crowds a little bit, but the weather should be good. And, um, and I'm sure I'll be sending out some other, some other teachings and other things that are coming up, but uh, enjoy the season, enjoy the celebration of Christ, and enjoy this time period that we're in. We have opportunity set before us and strive to follow the Lord in laying down our lives and loving our enemies. It, it can make a difference. Well, I love you guys. And um, we'll be sending out, we kind of got our podcast a little bit going last Saturday. Uh, I got hardware on place and things are ready. And so we're going to be starting that. And hopefully that will be some of our first teachings about the Gospel of John in that kind of format of, of interview and uh, just a little bit of different look than just a talking head. So anyway, you guys have a great day, weekend. And I will look forward to seeing you all soon. Bless you.